Hello, audience. Hello. Hello. How goes it tonight? Fantastic. My name's Emily. I'm going to make an unconventional move and tell you the moral of my story first. Um, it's come to my attention that a lot of storytellers from Kipling to Grimm have a habit of telling their tale and then waiting till the end to weave it all together like pulling a string through Cheerios. Boring, I say. Where's the fun in that? Cut to the chase and then cut to the part where grandma is eaten by a wolf. This is what we're here for. <laughs> So, uh, that being said, the moral of my story is this, love will find you in unexpected ways, something like that. <clears throat> the first time I saw Matthew, I was setting up my dorm room. He was walking past my open door, eyes straight ahead, as if someone down the hallway was waving a scooby snack at him. Poor kid, my mom remarked. His parents must have left him here alone. It was the fall of 2019. We were both entering our freshman year at Concordia University in Montreal. I was in the acting program, and Matthew was in computer arts. But I didn't know that yet. I didn't know anything about Matthew except that he seemed to be walking around the campus like a stray cat. Audience, I am going to make another disclaimer. I am not here to make myself look good, okay? I'm here to say it like it is. And I will tell you right now, my first objective upon arrival to campus was not to orient myself or prepare for classes, it was to get laid. I quickly made three friends. Lionel, number one, he lived about six doors down, curly brown hair that was almost red, anxious, verbose, stuck in his head. I gave him a primary bangability score of seven out of ten. <laughs> character. Um, Christopher! He claimed he wasn't gay, but once in the middle of the night during a fire drill, I watched a mystery man exit from his dorm in a row. Chris was aloof, intriguing, but unavailable. Bang ability score 11 out of I wasn't loved enough as a child. And then there was Matthew, 2 out of 10. <laughs> A week later, I had not banged anyone. Instead, I was becoming increasingly disillusioned with my acting program. I was disheartened by creaky theaters and storage wings that flooded. I learned very quickly I had a low tolerance for the word cohort. <laughs> and group breathing exercise left me restless. At the end of the day, I would take a bus back to residence with Matthew. It turns out we shared a schedule. I complained about my classes, and he'd listen with an intensity I was unfamiliar with, except for times like this. When I'm in a dark room and a bunch of people are staring in a dark room with me, looking at me, waiting to hear what I'll say next. <sighs> Here are two things I liked about Matthew. One, Matthew rarely spoke, but when he... <laughs> did, it was so witty, sarcastic, and on point, I found bedrock beliefs about myself being crushed like candy glass. Two, he was popular in a way that didn't make sense to me, because he was gangly and awkward. He had glasses and long hair and sported bell-bottom pants. He was introverted. Matthew didn't party, but that didn't stop the tallest, brawniest, and most conventionally attractive boys in the residence stopping him in the hallway to say hi. Eventually, the year 2020 rolled around. It seemed like a promising one. <laughs> now, here in Squamish territory, the topography is luscious and rolling. The mountains feel like a cradle, but in Montreal, the broad sky left me exposed. The horizon seemed to be warring with realities. On Boulevard de Maisonneau, the Webster Library had a large clock counting down the minutes until it was too late to do anything about climate change. <laughs> Every night there was a new open mic or cipher springing up in an enticing seedy location. Also, China was dealing with this rapidly spreading Wuhan virus, which I mean, suck for them. <laughs> One 
night in the common room, Lionel, Chris, Matthew, and I are making tea and shooting the shit. And I say something, I really can't remember what it was, but it was funny because Matthew laughed and then I said, do you find me amusing? And Matthew said yes, without hesitation, and my heart kind of did this thing. In the coming weeks, Matthew becomes a problem like a Rubik's Cube made out of jelly bellies. It was a delicious problem, but a problem nonetheless. When I'd written him off, things were easier, but now my life was quickly becoming a run-on sentence and Matthew's presence was the punctuation. I was on an improv team. I'm in a play. I'm writing and distributing posters in solidarity with indigenous rail blockades. Somewhere along the line, some fellow radical suggests I spearhead a funeral march for the planet, and I'm like, sure, whatever, bruh. Also, the Wuhan virus is now called COVID-19, and it's in Europe now, which sucks for them, I guess. <laughs> One night, I try to meditate, but I can't meditate. I can't breathe. It's awesome. I ask Matthew to come over. <laughs> When COVID-19 finally hits Montreal, the students become like feral guinea pigs. <laughs> roaming in packs along boulevards, taking mental notes of supermarket ruins and antiquated gender segregated school entranceways. Places we would inevitably conquer when society collapses. The cafeteria serves us food in pre-wrapped portions. Over lunch, I tell Matthew that I'm thinking of going back home to Vancouver and not returning. When I ask him what he thinks, he says, I can't tell you what's best for you. And I start to cry a little bit. The dorms shut down, my friends leave. Matthew's family comes to pick him up. I beg him to keep a vine I've been growing in my room that I call TikTok. <laughs> I watch Matthew's car drive away. Then I get on a plane and I never see him again. Sometimes I really wish I was a lady killer, which is not to be confused with serial killer, okay? Because a lady killer is a man who women find irresistible. But that's never gonna happen for some <laughs> fairly obvious reasons. I mean, I don't have the looks. Don't look for cards. I don't have, <laughs> make it so, the charm. I don't have the style. And most importantly, I don't have the confidence. And I don't have the confidence because I'm conflicted. I'm like one of those cartoon characters, I'm sure you've all seen them. Every time there's an important decision to be made, an angel pops up on one shoulder and goes, No, don't do it. And on the other shoulder, a devil pops up and goes, Yeah, do it. <laughs> Except in my case, it's not an angel on this shoulder. It's an unlicensed psychotherapist. <laughs> they always tell me the same thing. You're gonna attempt something you know you're not gonna succeed at. Could it be an issue with impulse control? <laughs> and on this shoulder, not a devil. It's a disbarred criminal defense lawyer. <laughs> and they say to me, ah, oh, you're not breaking any laws, go on. Now, an example of how all this can play out happened at this very story slam pre-COVID in the old venue back in 2019. And on that night, a young gal got up on stage, told a story about how she'd been raised in a Mormon household, how her whole life had been planned out for her, and how she rejected that and rebelled against it. And I liked the story. It was amusing, and it had a nice comedic pacing to it. So after the show, while the votes were being counted, I happened to step outside, and I looked over. And there she was, standing there by herself. So I decided to go talk to her. <laughs> no, don't do it. Ah, go on, you're not breaking any laws talking. <laughs> so I went up to her and I said, uh, hey, I liked your story. I thought it had a nice comedic pacing to it. You ever thought about trying stand-up comedy? Because you know. With that Mormon faith of yours, you got an arsenal of material. Like, what's with all the wives? And they're all dressed the same. And I'm going to stop right now to make sure everybody in this room is on the same page as me, okay? I know what's with all the wives. 
I know it is an indefensible brew of patriarchy and oppression with a little seasoning of pedophilia. I know that, okay? But understand this. The teenage boy that lurks inside of me cannot fathom how you can have multiple wives and they're all dressed the same? It makes no sense. <laughs> Unless they're all dressed like cheerleaders or Air France flight attendants or those gals in North Korea you must have seen with those parades with the big missiles and they're all wearing high boots and mini skirts and they've all got machine guns and they're just kicking it. I mean mini skirts and machine guns. It was at this point a young gal looked up from her phone and said that's a different way of looking at things and right then, right then I realized that while I thought I was cruising down the highway of affability, uh-uh, I was slowly drifting towards the off-ramp for Harvey Weinstein Boulevard. And if you're not familiar with where Harvey Weinstein Boulevard is, it's at the intersection of creepy and old man. So I got out of there. I said, nice talking to you. Hope to see you on stage again. And the minute I turned to leave, this one popped up and went, oh, oh, that was bad. That was really bad. And now she's going to tell Susan. And Susan's going to confront you. And she's going to go, Al, I respected you. But now this, this, well, that's it. You're banned. Banned from Story Slam. And no help on this shoulder either. It looks at me. And after that... Susan's gonna tell Brian, and he's gonna grab you with one of his big mitts, and he's gonna pin you against the wall, and he's gonna, we don't treat people like that, girl. <sighs> so did I learn anything? Did I learn anything from this experience? And the answer is yes, I did, and I'm gonna tell you what it is, and you're probably not gonna like it. This is what I learned. If that young gal did take my suggestion and do stand-up comedy, I got her opening line, and this is it. Picture me as young, blonde, and Mormon. So, I was brought up in a strictly traditional Mormon household in Provo, Utah, and right away, I know what you're all thinking, and no, I was not one of ten teenage brides, okay? There was only four of us. people will all tell you that the type of animal they own are the best. Dog people will tell you they're their best friend. Cat people will tell you the joys of ownership, not realizing that they're the ones that are owned. <laughs> and ferret people, well, ferret people know the truth. There's nothing like the joy of owning a cat snake, a sausage hamster, a noodle bear, a limousine mouse. They're the perfect mixture between owning an animal and having a child. If, so long as you're a fan of kids and their terrible tubes. No! <laughs> My ferrets could always bring me joy at the end of a long day. And one particular May long weekend has been a very long, long, long weekend. I was an event promoter and I would just come from running my biggest event ever, Weekend of Kink. Three nights of parties, two afternoons of workshops, a fetish photo tour of downtown. And I had finished up the Sunday night, actually, Monday morning at an after uh, party to celebrate our success. Now it was Monday afternoon, and I had arrived home after too little sleep, exhausted, and with just one task ahead of me. The weekend had more than broken even, and while the small profits would take a while to collect from ticket sellers, we had already paid everyone. Well, everyone but one. I had $400 for the guy who had designed our visuals. I was going to deliver it that very evening. I just needed to grab a quick nap and a burst of joy first. So I let my ferrets, Felix and Frankie, out of their cage. Felix for Felix the Cat, always getting into trouble. And Frankie for Frankenfurter, the Rocky Horror Picture Show character. And, well, because he was shaped like one. I brought them over to the couch with me as I lay down and let them run over me in the couch. I'd long ago ferret-proof my apartment you need to if you've got ferrets, as they can squeeze into the smallest of spaces, and they love to carry away things. My ferrets were particularly fond of anything leather or rubber, which can prove problematic when you're a fetishist. <laughs> but, 
I knew enough to keep all of that safely stored at heights they could not reach. As I closed my eyes, I, them, I saw them scurrying off out of the living room with just an index card, not unlike this one. But my speeches were the week, for the weekend were done now and I didn't need them anymore. I could lay back, relax, and contemplate a job well done. There was nothing to worry about anymore. Suddenly my eyes snapped open. I sat up. The envelope. I put the money for the visuals, $400 in an envelope. I looked over at the coffee table to see if it was still there. But of course it wasn't. It hadn't been an index card. I sprang into action. My ferrets had precisely seven places in the house they would carry things to hide. Seven places I had to search before they started to chew through that envelope and threw the money. Under my bed, nothing. Beneath the chair in the hall where I put on boots, nope. Back to the living room and under the couch, no luck. And on it went. Seven places I searched and seven places nothing. Not only no money, but no ferrets. They had another hiding place, somewhere they could get I didn't know about. I opened every cupboard and every closet in case they found a way to do that themselves, to squeeze in. The little bastards had robbed me. Me, who gave them a roof over their heads, food and love. This was how they repaid me. Nothing. Eventually I could look no more. I was exhausted and by mid evening I had to sleep. Ferrets aren't nocturnal as most people assume. They're crepuscular, most active at twilight and in the pre-dawn. They're awake six hours a day, ten at most. No doubt they were sleeping too, refusing to come out and return to their cage where I had left them a full three nights and four night days without the release they had come to expect daily. The next morning I awoke to ferrets scurrying over me. I was apparently forgiven and it was time for daddy to get up and play before they, they headed off to work. I had my ferrets, but where the F was the envelope of money? I'd look for it for days, for months. For, uh, for weeks, for months, I'd discover every time that my ferrets had not just seven hiding places in my home, but well over a dozen. Yet none of them contained an envelope full of money. Eventually I gave up, until one day I noticed Frankie sneaking off towards the kitchen. He seemed to look around, as if to make sure I wouldn't see him, but I caught him out of the corner of my eye. On, in stocking feet, I quietly followed him, saw him disappear under the lip of the cupboards by the kitchen sink. He went under and then up. I grabbed a flashlight and got down on the ground. And there was a hole about the size of a loony. I poked my finger through and found a cavity there. I grabbed a hammer to pull away the board. Lo and behold, there was a space about the diameter and length of one of my arms. Frankie stared back at me from a bed of paper. A lot of paper. Shredded paper. F me, F this, and F off. While I could never be certain of what all that paper was, they'd done a better job of shredding it than any machine from Staples could have. It, I was pretty sure I knew what made up part of their little nest. F off indeed. Ferreted off. <laughs> Managing your emotions as a wedding guest is kind of like trying to turn milk into yogurt. <laughs> Crank the heat up too much and you bubble up and boil over, making a chaotic mess. But not enough heat and you develop a slick and uncomfortable sheen. But if you heat the milk just right, you'll simmer gently and turn into something new. The last wedding I attended was in the summer of 2019 in Guyana, South America. I was there on a two-year stint as a sex ed vo volunteer, sex ed teacher volunteer with the US government, living with a host family and attempting to assimilate into Guyanese culture. I went into this experience expecting to form strong bonds with my host family and feel like I was making an impact on the communities I was gracious to be a part of. But while my four and six-year-old host siblings and I got along like a house on fire, I was never close with my host mother and was always <coughs> uncertain if she liked me. We would cook together and make small talk, but anytime someone else was in the room, I'd be ignored. 
After seven weeks there, I was increasingly uncertain about my purpose there as a volunteer, but increasingly more certain that my host mom did not like me. But then, one day, she invited me to attend our neighbor's wedding on her behalf. Despite my doubts, I leapt at the chance to experience more of Guyanese culture, undeterred by entering this new situation alone. On the day of the wedding, I carefully selected a bright orange floral dress, the fanciest Birkenstocks I packed with me, and I marched across the street. <laughs> Giant white tents stood guard on the front lawn, with chairs calmly resting underneath. Some guests had already arrived, and there didn't appear to be a seating plan or an usher. Given that I didn't know the neighbor, the couple getting married, or any of the guests, I thought it would be safest to sit in the back row. Once seated, though, I did the worst thing that you could do at a wedding. Think. I thought about how every day this week I'd been catcalled. I thought about how lonely I felt. And I thought about how my host siblings feared my host mom's words more than her wooden spoon. But mostly I thought about who I thought I was. Who was I to presume that I was the one meant to help? And wasn't it arrogant to assume that help was even needed? Who was I to think that I could provide a better perspective than a Guyanese teacher who was already here? And who was I to perpetuate American imperialism under the guise of service? What was I doing here? Should I pack up and go home? While my thoughts swirled, my back sweat, my body shook, and tears carved gullies down my cheeks. Mournful music then began to swell from the speakers, and with a jolt, I remembered where I was. Holy crap, was I crying at a wedding? A stranger's <laughs> wedding? While I tried to calm down, I looked around. It's not that unusual to cry at weddings. And the older guy and his gentleman next to me also was shedding some tears. But he probably had a closer relation to the wedding party. <laughs> <laughs> My breath was still shaky, and try as I might, I just couldn't stop the tears. Oh no, I was boiling over. <laughs> Come on, Maya, calm down. You cannot be the most distressed person at a wedding, let alone the wedding of someone you don't know. <laughs> As I tried to calm myself, I felt a hand on my shoulder, moving in the circles you'd use to comfort a small child. While attempting to calm me down, the gentleman next to me solemnly whispered, I understand, I understand. Losing someone is hard, even when it is their time to go. <laughs> that made me stop crying. <laughs> what? Losing someone? I hadn't lost anyone. And aren't we at a wedding? <laughs> Looking around, I realized that there were more folks crying than should be, and some were gravely walking inside. And now that I'm really paying attention, I hadn't seen a couple, or an aisle, or an altar. And this music, although in a different language, was suspiciously dour for a wedding. It felt more like music for a funeral. What was going on? I, I recognized my neighbor over there, my host mom said it was a wedding, but it clicked. I wasn't at a wedding. I was at a funeral. Did I mishear her? But no, no, she mentioned it multiple times, and I asked her if my outfit was wedding appropriate before I left the house, and she said yes. <laughs> what was going on? My kind steep buddy stood up, and as he walked away, he said, her body's resting inside whenever you're ready. Her body? Before I could help it, tiny giggles launched their way into my mouth. I wasn't just at a funeral. I was at a wake. And I had just been sobbing, and now I'm laughing at a wake. A stranger's wake. In my bright orange floral dress and my beaten down Birkenstocks. Trying to remain calm, I rose from my seat, walked through the house, and went to pay my respects before making a hasty exit. <laughs> after all, it's the least I could do after my absolutely unhinged behavior that day. <laughs> As I stood staring at the adorned body of a stranger, my thoughts stood still. My doubts didn't dissipate, nor did my questions quit quibbling, but the heat had turned from a boil back down to a simmer. After leaving the funeral, I meandered my way back to my host family's house. As I walked in the door, my host mom called out, How is the funeral? <laughs> Unable to bite my tongue, I responded, 
I thought you said it was a wedding. With a sly grin, she said, no, no, I said funeral. <laughs> well, I still didn't know what I was doing here or if I was staying, but at least now I knew my host mom didn't like me. And I'll take the small wins.